Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. And Dr. Murthy, thank you for the very kind introduction and very detailed. Um, I think uh, he's been very, very generous in uh, showering lots of praises on me, which I think I'm, you know, maybe halfway there somewhere. But um, Sam, um, I want to thank you for joining today. And uh, unfortunately, we can't see you on the video, but uh, maybe if it clears up, you can um, share your video as well. Looks like you are uh, muted on the video. Uh, so today, uh, our conversation uh, slightly different than the previous sessions. I've been listening to my previous speaker here and, and it was very uh, in interesting and enlightening uh, subject on using AI for healthcare. Uh, what we have here is actually a real life use case where we deployed uh, a solution for solving uh, in insurance fraud. Uh, the product that we have is called Aquila. It, it actually deployed at the, this company, uh, Employers, which is a publicly traded NASDAQ listed company. And um, the, the, the product addresses insurance fraud and also uh, in, is useful for insurance industry and healthcare. Uh, because we address what is called as provider fraud. And uh, I think we will get to all of those things uh, uh, in just a uh, few seconds because Sam can start from, uh, you know, in layman's terms from what is fraud, insurance fraud, and then go on. Uh, Sam, are you with me? Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, so, so this is our, uh, you know, product called Aquila. It was deployed, uh, you know, at... Uh, uh, employers for the last uh, more than two years now. And uh, uh, I'm Srini Medala. We have Sam King. Uh, and Sam has uh, more than 20 years industry industry experience in addressing fraud. And he was also in law enforcement before. And he uh, is very active in the uh, professional association uh, in associations in the country dealing with uh, fraud. Uh, there's a Northern California Fraud Association for which he was a, a president uh, for a couple of years. And then before that, you know, in a different capacity. And even now he's an active speaker and a thought leader in that space. Welcome, Sam. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we are here to talk about fraud. Thank you. So Sam, so much. please go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, say a few things about, uh, you know, what exactly you do, do at employers and, uh, and maybe you can also address a little bit about what is workers' comp insurance and fraud. That'd be great. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I've been uh, a little about my background is actually I've been in the industry for over 25 years, uh, the insurance industry, specifically in uh, workers' compensation um, and property casualty lines. Um, I am uh, vice president of Employers Insurance Group. Uh, we are in uh, in all 50 states. Uh, we operate, uh, except for these four states, where they have a uh, a state-run work comp program. So we are only in 46 states, actually, even though we're licensed in 50. So we we are nationwide. Um, our focus as a company is uh, the small business uh, employer. Um, we we are we tout that we are America's small business insurance specialist, and, and we only do workers' compensation insurance. Um, my background before coming to employers, I've been here almost uh, five years, and my background before coming to employers um, is I, I ran uh, some nationwide uh, private investigation companies, um, and then I also uh, I was a, a director at Travelers Insurance. And I was a director at a uh, uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance for their special investigation unit. So um, one of the things I want to get into is uh, what is workers' compensation and who needs it? What's the purpose? What does it serve? Um, workers' compensation insurance are, is required uh, by every state. Um, if you're an employer and you have an employee, you are required to have workers' compensation insurance uh, by state law. And uh, it's almost like uh, auto insurance. You know, you're required to have auto insurance. It's the same thing. Um, and uh, it works uh, similarly in regard to being a compulsory insurance product. Um, the other thing is, it is uh, just to understand, you know, what is covered. Um, we use the term AOE, COE, um, and what it means is that if 
a employee is injured on the job, uh, it has to the the injury has to arise out of their employment, and it has to occur in the course and scope of their employment. So AOE stands for arising out of employment. COE stands for course of employment. And uh, so those are the two caveats. One deals with what were they doing at the time they were injured? Were they doing something to benefit the employer at the time they were injured? Secondly, is you know what what time were they doing it? So if they are on the clock. Um, and they were they were doing something and they were really supposed to be off the clock, they may or may not be covered depending on what the facts tell us. So, um, and what they're covered for in workers' compensation is they're covered for uh, lost time. Uh, if they are not able to work, uh, they get, uh, a, actually it's a, a weekly uh, pay uh, for the lost wages. And it's usually about two thirds of their income, depending on how much money they make. Um, and so, secondly, is they get all the medical care they need. So, our goal in workers' compensation insurance claims is to actually get the injured worker back to work as soon as possible, but get them back to work healthy and uh, take care of their medical needs. Unfortunately, with workers' compensation, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of people that take advantage of the work comp system, and uh, that's where I come into play. Um, and Serini, if we can go to the fraud in the workers' compensation industry, the types yes. of fraud that we deal with. Yeah, can you see it? I changed um, the slide. Yeah, I, I I can't see it right now, but I, I have. Yeah, I did, I did. So yeah, I'll, right I'll now it says, through. yeah, it's a fraud in the workers' comp insurance industry. All right. Well, in the workers' compensation, we kind of categorize fraud. So uh, the fraud we usually deal with is in three categories. One is provider fraud. That could be a medical provider, uh, a doctor, a chiropractor, an attorney. Um, it could be, uh, you know, anybody billing the work comp system or claim. And then secondly is secondly is we have uh, premium fraud, which is really an employer not paying the proper rate for insurance. So if the employer lies about it um, and, and uh, give a little education here is, is when we talk about fraud, we're talking about a lie. Um, I always tell people the lie is the fraud, the fraud is the lie. So in premium fraud, if they lie about uh, you know how much payroll they have or how many employees they have, um, that's an area that we look at and, and, and people can be prosecuted for that as well. And then claimant fraud is where the actual person making the claim, the injured worker, um, is involved in, in telling us lies in order to get benefits uh, or in order to pursue a claim that we believe uh, where they lied. So uh, according to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, which actually uh, keeps a lot of these stats the problem in workers compensation just the fraud area alone in these three areas in workers compensation is 7.2 billion dollar problem um, i can tell you that the lion's share of that that 7.2 billion is in the provider fraud area and, and that's something that uh, we worked with sereni and his company um, soft soul to create akila uh, to really battle this provider fraud area. So you can go to the next slide, Serena. Yes. So can you tell something about the special investigative unit and why is it significant and what does it do in insurance company? Yeah, there's, uh, out of all 50 states, there's 26 states that require an insurance company to have a special investigation unit. Um, and that special investigation unit is what I run. I'm the vice president of our fraud investigation program, which is our special investigation unit. We have investigators. Uh, I have a team of uh, fraud analysts and investigators. Um, and the focus is to identify and refer suspected fraud to the Department of Insurance and to various prosecutorial entities, such as the attorney district attorney's offices uh, in California, in other states like Nevada, it might be uh, the attorney general's office. So, um, and then we have to submit annual compliance reports to describe what we're doing in attacking fraud and what is going on with, uh, you know, our production in regard to pursuing fraud, fraudulent, uh, um, um, you know, submissions to our company. Okay. 
So Sam, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to the next slide. We're talking about the traditional tools to combat fraud and, and maybe yeah. you can touch um, a little bit about that and see how we can, how we evolve from there and then how, what kind of complex frauds that you see nowadays and why is it so complex and why the traditional tools are not adequate? Right. You know, traditionally uh, we talk about, you know, we categorize them, but uh, there's, there's, there's several ways we get it. Tip, tips, um, a lot of tips, uh, we have a fraud hotline. Most insurance companies have a fraud hotline uh, where tips can come in. Uh, could be a tip from an employer. Could be a tip from uh, a, a competitor of an employer that we're insuring, or it could be a tip from um, you know another employee or someone, um, or even the uh, uh, law enforcement industry. Sometimes we get tips from them, but uh, tips are traditional. These are traditional ways we get you know alerts on cases. Um, we have uh, we we will do undercover filming or surveillance, and uh, that's something we hire private investigation companies to to do for us. Uh, but uh, typically, that's done uh, in primarily the claimant area, where we believe the 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 person making the, the injured worker is not as injured as they're claiming they are. So we'll follow them, and we'll actually do surveillance and undercover filming to find out what they're doing um, when they don't know we're watching. And then lastly is, is just investigators. We, we take statements, uh, we interview people, we try to find, do fact finding um, and finding out what is going on with a claim um, and is there, are, is someone lying to us or does it really check out? You know, so uh, most of our investigators come from law enforcement background. Uh, I have a law enforcement background myself prior to coming into the insurance industry um, and that is is very helpful because we understand how to investigate matters including uh workers compensation claims okay great so maybe what we can do then we can talk about one or two uh, quick examples uh, to give an idea of what kind of uh frauds typically occur and how complex they are uh, and then you know oftentimes the fraud is not very direct you can't actually see any particular individual or a party who who's benefiting it uh, usually these things happen in so many small, small, uh, you know, I guess, actions and inactions that ultimately result in benefiting somebody somewhere. And it's very hard to see them uh, with naked eye and very obviously. So you have to have some kind of tools to get there. So um, I'm showing this uh, screen that I don't know if uh, you have it in front right. of you. It's the example one that the $200 million fraud scheme that we have. Yes. Um this is an interesting fraud scheme and, and I'll kind of share it because uh, of these, these, this is one of the reasons we began to really work on building a provider fraud tool and, and really needing a solution uh, and something to help us with is, is to combat this kind of fraud, uh, which hit us hard this particular case. Um, but it hit the industry with $200 million in fraud uh, that was paid out. Um, it hit us. We were in the millions in this too uh, as a company. Uh, but basically, this the scheme was they had uh, this was a call center. Uh, it involved doctors, attorneys, um, and what they would do is uh, they had a call center. They would sign up. Um, they'd have a sign up agent. They'd go and sign up. Uh, they they would they would recruit people to file workers' compensation claims even though they were not injured, and then they would uh, sign them up, and they would tell them they can get a lot of money by doing so. They'd sign them up with an attorney through a sign-up agent. They would file the paperwork, and then they would send these these claim uh, or injured workers um, to various doctors. Um, they would they, were, they had copy services. They had interpreters, um, so that they would actually uh, utilize uh, you know and bill for copy services and interpreting. Um, and they would bill for uh, medical treatment. Oftentimes, it wasn't even rendered. And then they would submit uh, that through the attorney to the work comp carrier. And ultimately, um, every time they did something, they would bill us for that work. And, and I'll get into the three schemes uh, as we go to the, maybe go to the next slide. Yes. Um, here's, here's the specific examples. There was three indictments in this case. Um, and they would get work comp patients to this call center. They would send them to a chiropractor. The chiropractor would do manipulations or maybe not do manipulations because a lot of this was fraudulent. 
they would fill out the paperwork and send a bill in. And then they would send them to an imaging company. It was called California Imaging, and they had uh, numerous locations, over 12 locations in California. Um, and they would take an MRI of a specific area that was hurt. And then they would submit the claim, their claim to the, and the bill to the insurance carriers. Um, and what the chiropractor, the reason he sent patients to California Imaging, he sent every patient to them, is because uh, they created a, California Imaging created a middle company called Willows Consulting. They would actually get a kickback. They would pay it through very, you know, it wasn't directly from California Imaging to the chiropractor. It was through a company that created Willows Consulting. And then that chiropractor created two companies called Line of Sight and Desert Blue Moon, um, which were paid, they paid them for consulting. So it was a shell, these were shell companies for the purpose of getting a kickback back to the chiropractor for referrals of patients. Maybe you go to the next uh, slide, Serena, and I'll show yeah. you this in, in second indictment. Yes. Yeah. The second indictment involved uh, um, the uh, the uh, George Reese who owned the uh, California Imaging, um, he would send patients again to another to other doctors, and it was several doctors, and they had the same scheme. They would bill insurance companies, um, and uh, most of these uh, were for uh, shockwave treatments, um, and they would do a shockwave treatment for twenty twenty one hundred dollars each. Um, and uh, it, it, it is what it sounds like. It's, they call it a shockwave. It's much like a TENS unit. Uh, they shock the area of your body that, you know, is uh, with small shocks that um, is supposed to help you. Uh, and it, very, it could be helpful with some people if they really had a problem. But uh, they would utilize that. They would bill the insurance company $2,100. Again, they had an intermediary. So George Reese was getting paid for sending patients to them. And so this is kind of a, this is the same $200 million fraudulent okay. uh, act in what was going on. And then there's one more example. Yeah, I have that. Um, so they would, uh, the indictment number three is they would actually, uh, uh, these patients all went to, to an attorney. So when they did a sign up and they had the sign up agents, the attorneys typically made $5,000 on every claim um, that they had or every injured worker that they had. Um, and so Julian Garcia was an attorney and he would actually pay $50 per patient back to uh, the signup agency. Uh, and that's illegal. You cannot pay for referrals to get patients. Okay. So, um, well, as you can see, Sam, I think, uh, you know, the kind of things that you just showed us uh, they are very difficult to solve with the traditional tools that you mentioned before, which is basically the surveillance and, you know, private investigators and, and uh, you know, hidden cameras and stuff like that. That's where... Yeah, we, yeah go ahead. We, we're, we're typically... Uh, that, that was one of the problems. One of the problems with traditional areas, you know, we, 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 we wouldn't be able to connect. Are these people billing from the same address? Are they billing from the same location? Um, we really have to look at their billing and, and the reports uh, that are being submitted to to tie them together um, that, hey, wait, there's something wrong here. And uh, we're getting, uh, you know, the service is being rendered at the same location, no matter what okay. uh, what what entity is providing the service. Those Let's talk things. about some use cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sam, do you want to talk about some use cases? Which is yeah, we can, number 14, the, the kickback for referrals, suspicious connections, stuff like that. Yeah, we, we can get into that. Uh, do you want to keep going through the slides a little bit and talk about some of the uh, modern approaches that we're, we've, we've yeah, developed? Yeah, uh, let, 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 yeah, sure. So do you want me to add a few things here? Or do you, you want to, you, you are, are you have this uh, slide 13, the yeah. dashboard link analysis? Can you yeah, see? I have it. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have it. So, so I'll uh, and, and Serena, you can you can uh, you know chime in any time because obviously I will. Maybe from, from your side, share what, how you felt yeah. each of this was useful and how you addressed fraud using what what was here. So what we did is we took we took uh, 
millions of lines of data of all of all, all the providers that have billed us that are in our in our system and, and we put we put them into uh, uh, a data analytic tool where we can really slice and dice and really analyze things and, and one of the first things we created was a provider dashboard um, and we created a lot of uh, information from our side in regard to is the provider if they're if they are a doctor are they properly licensed or if they are a doctor, uh, do they have the proper uh, fictitious name permit if they're not using their own name? Uh, things like that, that that are legal requirements in order to properly bill an insurance company. So we began to look at all the credentialing issues. Um, then we began to look at, um, you know, um, are, is this provider, uh, we, we, we created a, a, a myriad of use cases where we looked at things like, is this provider, uh, um, you know, um, billing us on a holiday, a public holiday, or on a uh, a weekend. Um, and typically, unless you are a, a, an urgent care or you are a uh, hospital, you don't bill on the weekends or, or a, you know, public holidays. So those are things that just kind of stood out, you know, because we could see the service dates that they were billing for. Um, and then we began to look at that. And oftentimes, those type of things become kind of the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. We start digging into it, we look at it, we, and then we find out, oh, there's all these other problems going on as we start targeting and looking at that provider uh, based on that indicator. Um, the other thing we did is we created a link analysis process where we could actually see who is connected to who, who is re referring, what doctor is referring um, um, the patient or the injured worker to another doctor or to another provider of some sort, like an MRI provider, um, who, and who is, you know, what is the connection between all of these entities? Um, we, we began looking at the uh, reporting that went along with that so we can pull reports and, and do all kinds of advanced reporting in regard to understanding uh, what we're seeing in the data. We began looking at claim analytics in regard to really digging down into uh, using uh, some of our use cases and understanding, um, you know, what is, you know, what are the other providers that are billing on a public holiday or on a, on a weekend? I mean, that's just one use case, but, um, you know, that type of thing. And then billing information. We, we took all the billing information. So even the lines of deep detail and um, like your other provider was, uh, the other present presenter was talking about, we began looking at the CPT codes and the ICD-9 codes um, and looking at all of that, um, uh, the, the actual bill, what they were billing us for and the, the, uh, uh, the code, the billing code that they were billing us for and then drilling down from there um, in, in regard to, you know, why, why and, and trying to figure out why are they billing us so many of these particular uh, modes of treatment or evaluation. Um, and then we have a provider search, so we can actually look at every provider. It doesn't mean they're fraudulent, but we got every provider in there. And just in case we want to dig into that and understand how much are they billing us? How much are we paying them overall? One of the problems that we had is, you know, insurance companies have, typically they have a bill review company or they, have, or they own one or they have one they outsource with. And bill review companies, they don't, they look at individual bills and they say, okay, well, this individual bill, they're billing for uh, this procedure or this evaluation. And it seems like they're billing pretty high and the, and the standard rate should be um, lower. So they reduce that one bill to a lower rate. Right. Well, what happens is uh, that, that's typically what they do, but they don't holistically look at all the bills. How many, they don't look at how many bills are we getting from this particular provider? Uh, this particular doctor, this particular chiropractor, how many bills are we getting from this uh, MRI company uh, among all of our claims? Right. And so we began to really look at that billing information to understand it and then be able to drill that down by provider. Um, and Serena, I don't know if you want to go into more. Yeah, I just want to add a, a simple analogy, uh, Sam, you and I, we always talk about this. Uh, for those of you, uh, I think, you know, for example, if you're driving and if you get a, you know, somebody cop catches somebody for speeding or, or a red light, it's a traffic ticket. On, on the face of it, it looks like a simple thing. Okay. You know, it's a speeding, you get a ticket, you go on. But then that whole thing will change completely differently if you look at 
if you're able to find out that, okay, the first, the car that was, you know, uh, used in the speeding incident actually was stolen. And, and then, you know, and it was stolen from a location where, you know, a robbery or something has been reported before and something else has happened. And basically what I'm saying is, when you look at one small thing, it looks very benign and simple. Uh, and a multitude of that in the in the context of bigger picture, and it gives a lot more, shares a lot more light on it and the different actions are required for uh, some of those things. And that's exactly what we do here. Uh, you know, a simple photocopying thing is, is a simple building thing. A provider can um, build the insurance company for, um, you know, uh, uh, transcribing or photocopying 20 medical records for like five cents each. That's a simple, small transaction, $20, $30, it will be done with. But then imagine, imagine that happening on a, you know, a multiple, uh, multitude of scale from, uh, for the same uh, incident, but hundreds of times, and then month after month. And, and actually things like that have happened. And that's what uh, you know, the uh, use of these analytics and tools and AI would help in addressing those, uh, in, in putting the context into context, uh, a big picture. Sam, you can quickly and, and draw that, some use cases if you like, you know. Uh, yeah, um, give me an idea. Some of the use cases that we look at is, we, we developed uh, uh, numerous use cases, but uh, we kind of categorized where they're at. So, so we have uh, um, a use case involving suspicious connections. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to what Serini was saying, you know, um, it's a, uh, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, getting pulled over for a ticket analogy. Um, if we start seeing the same provider, every time that provider bills us, then we get another bill from another provider and another provider. And there's, it seems like there's three or four providers that are billing us every time on the same claims routinely. Then there's, that, that becomes suspicious because, you know, you, you may have uh, people you like to use or whatever, but every time you have four or five of the same people that, you know, that, that's a suspicious type situation. So we, we began looking at that. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is kickbacks for referrals. And the examples that we discussed uh, of the three indictments, all three of those were kickbacks for referral of patients. And so we created uh, um, use cases um, just involving kickbacks for referrals and understanding, you know, what what are we going to see if if we dig down into the billing? What are the things that we normally see if we find out later that there's a kickback? And and oftentimes to build these use cases, you have to look at, you know, the actual cases that you had before. So the examples we shared, we looked at those at those companies and we we, we kind of traced it back. Like, what could we have learned? at the beginning of those claims to understand that there was really a kickback for referral going on. And that's how we built our use cases. So when we, we began to deal, drill down to what was, what was happening and what could we see from a billing viewpoint, from a paperwork viewpoint being submitted to us, uh, from a data analytic viewpoint, and then build those use cases to understand that and be able to identify those things early on. Right. Um, unlicensed services. Is a, is a big one. Um, you know, if they're not licensed, we don't have to pay them. And unfortunately, we have, we have people that are, it's unfortunate, but we have comp, uh, individuals that are uh, running medical offices and medical clinics and hiring doctors to work for them that are not even doctors. And that's illegal. Um, you can't do that. Um, and and uh, it's the corporate practice of medicine. It happens all the time. Uh, it's unfortunate. And uh, but it's it's fraud fraud if they do it and um, and so we we are really digging into un looking and under uncovering that information. So, so um, Sam, for example, the unlicensed services, for example, in the traditional world, it would have been almost impossible to do that until after a long time. And uh, in the current world, right now, we have an interface with the medical board, for example. And uh, that would actually give us uh, before the, you know, uh, right away, if somebody has been suspended last week and then we have a bill come in uh, and which has billed uh, during the time that suspension is in effect, we could immediately catch that kind of thing right away. And it, these kind of things were extremely laborious, almost impossible before. Is that right, Sam? Exactly. 
Exactly. So you're you're now able to through external data, we're able to really understand and cover this information very quickly without having to do manual checks ourselves. Um, and, and it just it puts you know this information right on our provider dashboard. So it, it's outstanding. Um, the other area is treatment not rendered. Now, this is something that, you know, there's, there's, you know, how do we know treatment was not rendered? That's the big question. And so one of the things we do there is, is we, we begin to uncover, well, uh, you know, there's certain types of treatment, the treatment for that particular patient takes a certain amount of time. And so we're able to evaluate and, and um, let, let's just say, take an example. Let's say we say it takes 20 minutes, um, but we uncover that we received 148 treatments for 20 minutes each from uh, among all of our claims on the same day. Well, there's not enough time in the day to have that many treatments if, you, if, they, if they require 20 minutes with the doctor. Um, and so we're able to undercover that kind of information. And you'll be surprised just looking at our own claims, how many of those we catch. Um, unbundling, um, uh, that, that deals with, uh, uh, we, we have people that will build two uh, CPT codes, which is a billing code uh, with a payment amount attached to it. Uh, they'll build two codes when they should have built one. And, and so it kind of is, uh, it's not treatment not rendered, but it's 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 a method of of getting higher, yeah. higher higher uh, billing um, on your bills. So instead of charging, uh, like say McDonald's, uh, Sam, instead of charging, for example, like a combo in McDonald's, like if you order a meal, they will basically charge you for each one separately, a drink and the sandwich and and the fries and everything, and then add up a little bit lot more than the combo would cost. Exactly, exactly, and and the difference is it's required. To bill you the lower amount if it fits into those categories, yeah. so yeah. Um, that's required by law. So Sam, uh, I have switched over there. to the next slide. Um, the Mr. Madala, you may like to conclude. How much Just time we have? We have run over five minutes, six minutes. That's okay. Okay, so I shall I, shall, can we have six uh, ninety seconds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. As okay. I said, conclude. Yeah. Okay, great. So Sam, I, I will take over and then conclude the next few slides if it's okay with you. That sounds good, yes. Okay, so for the audience, uh, you know, what I like to do is uh, I like to just quickly go over the, this is a real life uh, case study and then we presented it last year and then there's some, you know, some the interesting results were there, I like to share that as well. But for those of you who are technology folks who are most of you are, um, and you know, a lot of speakers have covered lots of uh, technologies used. And what I like to do is I quickly summarize what we uh, did and uh, just to give an idea of how we did it. Um, so, so if you, to give an idea of the insurance uh, industry and how the technology has been impacting, in, especially in the fraud side, you know, to recap, this was a traditional way of doing. And, and basically what we saw was an evolution today uh, from, Imagine the, the leftmost one was where we have everything was done manually, like a, the, you know, the surveillance camera and private investigators. And if you look at the late, the rightmost side of the slide, we, we have the cloud and cloud AI and, uh, you know, um, and analytics is, is where we are today. And uh, the transition occurred in multiple stages. Uh, I think the, about 10 years ago, you know, uh, we were able to really start taking advantage of big data, uh, but then uh, by having, you know, AI would as actually, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, it unleashed the potential a lot more than what we had in just about uh, five, ten, five, 10 years ago. Now, uh, the value proposition of what we did, you know, is, is basically, you know, uh, it, it, it uh, what normally would have taken for Sam and his team to, for example, if a legal uh, lawsuit came in, uh, to actually comply with all the uh, losses the insurance company occurred and in, in, in help provided to the to the uh, district attorney or their own legal department, it would take months to compile the evidence. Today, in less than one uh, one day, they can the the SIU can actually put together all the evidence, including what all the 
uh, violations are and what is the magnitude of the fraud and who committed and what are the parties involved. And that's a significant advantage in, a, you know, in having something like this. And what Sam had was in the first year goal of saving $1 million. And the first year uh, ROI, you know, basically the savings were $14.3 million in, in, in fraud that they saved. And finally, I like to share these two quick slides. And, and uh, you know, at a very high level, what we did was we had multiple external data sources and multiple internal data sources. And then we used our secret sauce and how we organized it and then how we ran the algorithms and, and, and provided the, the users, uh, in this case, the fraud uh, department with uh, all the tools required, not just individual analytics on, uh, you know, on the provider data, but also a powerful link analysis, which would you know, really identify the connections between different parties when there's a collusion involved. 90% of the challenge is not just to provide the research and the reporting, but what is more valuable to, to the fraud uh, you know, department is when they come in every day, like for example, Sam comes to the office today, they should know the top 10 providers they should be focusing on. You know, they have hundreds of thousands of providers. They're all doing their job. You can't keep on knocking everybody's door and try to investigate them. You don't have the resources to do it, nor there is a justification for it. So what our, the, the single purpose of this, if I were to tell you, is we give them as they come to the office and they have fraud analysts and the vice president comes in, today, Sam, you should worry about these 10 people. And here's the reason why. And here is the extent of the fraud that is likely to be there. The suspicious behavior indicates there's a 5 million fraud in this provider and for these reasons. And I think that is the powerful information that we provide to them. And, and for those of people who are involved in AI and other things, one other small thing I'd like to share is it starts from the very beginning of the uh, you know, capturing of the data itself. Uh, as previously, we used to do this fraud months and years after fraud has occurred. Sometimes, you know, because of the way it is set up right now, uh, if a claim form comes in, uh, for those of you who can see the slide here, we, as soon as the data is captured, even if there's a scanned document, uh, you know, if a provider information is captured and we have the wherewithal to immediately check at that point, if that provider was unlicensed for that day, for example, and that way, saving that humongous amount of time and effort to wait for six more months to catch this fraud, they can ca catch it right away. So these are, I mean, I just want to quickly uh, add these things and, uh, and, and leave you with uh, the thought that, okay, you can, you can come up with a lot more possibilities and a lot more creative solutions than what we have articulated. But uh, if you do come across those ideas, please share that with me. And I like to thank you for uh, participating and Dr. Murthy for giving us the opportunity and Sridhar and Global AI conference and Sam also for his time. Thank you.